Okay, this is it. This is part two in a video entitled Two or More Witnesses. And I said I was going to actually record this video yesterday and I didn't do it because I just feel so reluctant to share so much of a journey in one video. I just don't feel like I'm going to be able to do it. But I know God can do anything and he keeps nagging at me today that I need to do this. I know this is important to him, so I'm going to do it. I know that what he wants me to share is a hindsight view or summary of what it, all that he has done. And he's done so much in me that I just don't feel like, how do you even begin to start talking about this? So I'm just going to start talking about it and he's going to do what he does. For those of you who don't know, on the homepage of this channel, there are two books that I wrote. One is a workbook and one is a basic, basic textbook. And the basic text is called A Soul Aligned, and it talks about the importance of conformity to God uh, as you are growing into this new creation. It talks about a lot of things. It's a very, very big book. It talks about the, the healing process, the design that God has given us, and the healing process that he has established. He uses healing and salvation synonymously, and he has, he has designed us for salvation, and so he has designed us, accord, our, our design for healing is according to being healed as a spiritual being from this curse and this condition that has been placed on us. But one of the things that I talk about in A Soul Aligned is I share a bit of my story. In fact, I share quite a bit of my story throughout. I think that it's very important. And it turns out God thinks so too. <laughs> he uses our testimony. And so in A Soul Aligned, you know, you may have, you may have, if you've read, and, and by the way, these books are, these, these are offered to you for free. Everything that I do is offered to you for free. We don't make a marketplace of God. And I trust God implicitly to take care of my needs. So I shared a bit in that first chapter. And the reason I shared is not so that I can sort of dump and explain everybody else, how it's everybody else's fault for my life. I explained enough for you to understand how my sin resulted from my unresolved suffering that the world likes to call trauma and make that some sort of a diagnosis or a condition. Because the reality is, is that I have a sovereign God. God is in control of everything and everything that he has sent in my life, though it was very, you know, I had a very rough start at life. I was born into a very difficult family with a lot of abuse and a lot of heartache, and no direction, no shepherds, no mentorship. And so that start at life was very difficult, and it led to a lot of sin. But having a sovereign God, I know now that God has been building me from the very beginning, and that any attempt to run away from healing from or dealing with any of that, or as in what I did, which was to go to a lot of 12-step programs and a lot of therapy, take a lot of medications. I mean, good grief, I did everything I could to heal. And there was no, no opportunity for healing because there was no truth and there was no Christ. But the reality is that I have a sovereign God who wants me to heal and who says in his word that he restores us so that we will serve him, so that we will teach transgressors his ways, so that we will be his witnesses, so that we will testify to what the truth is, so that we will go to others and say, I sinned and I did not get what I deserved, and I will live to enjoy the light of life. As a young adult, just as I was finishing up graduate school, my father committed suicide. That weekend, I was supposed to graduate from graduate school with my doctorate, and my father killed himself. Actually, excuse me, it was the following weekend that I was supposed to graduate, because a week after my dad killed himself, our home caught on fire, and our dog died, and we were completely misplaced. And two months after that, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and I spent the next two years with her dying. And it wasn't just those experiences. It was all the trauma of what I had experienced as I was growing up, as I had been kept from my mom by a very, very evil father. All of those things coming up and then the things that I was doing, like over drinking to deal with it and the absolute chaos inside of me, this storm. And I started to get really, really sick and I continued to get really, really sick for the next seven years. No doctor could tell me what was going on, but they never, they never ceased to give me a diagnosis and a pill and a procedure and everything else that they do. They could not tell me what was going on. So let me tell you some of the things that would happen. 
first of all, I could not eat. I would get very, very sick. The only thing that I could eat was beef and salmon. If I ate a vegetable, I would be in bed for three days with flu-like symptoms, like very serious flu-like symptoms, literally in my bones, my muscles aching, totally debil debilitated. And so I ate beef and salmon, I think, for about two years. And during the last year, I couldn't have salmon anymore, and I was starting to react to beef. I would have what they were calling histamine reactions, although I don't know where the histamine was coming from because all I was doing was eating beef. And I would end up with these sort of hive-like welts all over my body, and within a couple days, they would blister, and then they would pop, and then I would have open sores all over my body from head to toe, in my nostrils, everywhere. And they would last about two weeks. I could hardly move without provoking one of those reactions. I had to move really slowly. And so fast forwarding, I would have all of these reactions that were just unexplainable. Medicine could not understand what, what this was. And thank God, no one could explain to me what this was. I'd been in therapy for almost 30 years, never to get better, only worse. And at the end, I was in bed for 22 hour days. I could not get up. And if I did get up, I had to move very slowly. And I would lay in bed and I would scream at God. I would scream at him to take me. Why did he have me here? I had been reaching out to God for a long time, for many years here and there but I hadn't done it consistently. I hadn't done it single-mindedly. Every time he would restore me from something, I would go back out to the world. There was no way to get my attention, but to bring me down to nothing. So I have no judgment with anybody else because God only had to bring me to the brink of death. And he started to talk to me and he started to tell me why it was that I was not going to be able to move very quickly. Because all my life I had moved very quickly. I had multitasked and I had, you know, prided myself on being an achiever and getting my doctorate and running three businesses. These are the things I did with my grief when my parents died. I built three businesses. All my life I had been running so fast and being a machine for the world or a machine for my dad. So he slowed me down to where I couldn't move quickly. He made me lay in bed for 22-hour days, and he said, you will rest. He didn't allow a single therapist, medical doctor, naturopath. I mean, I had all of the money I could possibly have to pay for the best treatments, and no one could even make a dent in what I was going through. And the more idolatry I chased, the worse I got. And I'm so grateful that he did that. And I know why he did it, so that he got the glory, because... When it came time for him to bring me into what he actually requires, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was him because he caused me to throw out all of those supplements, all of those medications. I had so many medications and supplements that I had a plastic egg tray where I put all of them, you know, okay, this one in the morning, this one in the afternoon, this one in the evening, these piles of drugs, that one egg crate that hold, held... I think I still have it. I think it holds nine eggs. That egg tray held three days worth of medication. <laughs> and it's pretty deep. Like it's pretty deep. It can hold a lot of pills. He had me throw all of that stuff out. Do you know how scary that was to throw it out? Because I thought that'd been keeping me alive, making me feel better. Do you know that I actually felt better when I stopped taking it because I didn't have a stomach ache with a stomach full of pills? And he woke me up at 4.30 every morning. And you know why he did that? Because I'll tell you right now, I'm not a morning person or I've never been a morning person. It was not my idea to wake up at 4.30. But because there was nothing to do and nothing to think about, nothing to stew over at 4.30 in the morning, he could have my attention. And he had me go out on my, in my backyard at my table and he would start convicting me and telling me the things that I needed to write out, that I needed to journal, that I needed to examine. He started walking me through a process of repentance that I had never known, had never understood. And as I was going through this process of repentance, I was starting to get better. He was starting to heal me. And I would hear his voice and I would just say over and over, Lord, this is all I've ever wanted. I can do anything. I can give up all of the idols. This is all I've ever wanted. I was filled with so much joy to have his voice and his presence in my life. A joy that I had never known, 
that I could have never conceived of, a joy and a presence that gave me so much confidence that I didn't need any of the things that I chased, whether it was relationships or money, any of the things that I had felt so fearful of my entire life. And what I didn't realize is that when you return to God and you begin this process of repentance and you respond to him, he casts out that spirit of fear and he fills you with his spirit of peace. Both spirits cannot reside in you. He has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, power, sound mind, and self-control. His spirit is a spirit of peace, and that is the only way to get that. And I thought that if I found the right man who would love me, that if I had enough money and a secure career, I wouldn't be afraid anymore. So those are the things that I chased. Compulsively, desperately, even giving up the good things in my life the good blessings in my life because I bought into the lie that the world, that Hollywood, that secular music feeds us. As God was healing me, one of the things that he told me is this will only be a thorn in your side. I knew that he was healing me because I knew what I was feeling inside. And I also knew from his spirit intuitively what was going on. I could tell that he was healing me. I felt brighter the skin color, the color of my skin changed from a gray to actually being alive, like looking like I was alive. And I was, I used to sit at that back table and I would normally, I mean, usually I'm in flip-flops. I live in Southern California. That's, that's our shoe of choice. And I was in my robe and wearing flip-flops and I had been pruning my rose bush behind me and apparently didn't do a full cleanup because I stepped on a little branch that had thorns in it. And he said to me, this will only be a thorn in your side. This physical illness will only be a thorn in your side. And yet not really the physical illness. So I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't even know what a thorn was in scripture. But I understood from him at that moment that there was something that was going to remain. I have never had another outbreak like that where I broke out in welts and blisters. I'm able to eat, although I can't eat like I did at one time in my life without ending up with, you know, like if I overdo it, God sends me consequences. But the consequences that God sends me are compensatory to my behavior. If I behave compulsively, he's going to give me a compulsive consequence. And I've talked, I've spoken about that sometimes on the channel, eating chili oil compulsively, and then I ended up with a, with a rash. But these are consequences. I'm no longer sick. I know what sick feels like. A thorn keeps you low. And Paul's not the only one who had a thorn. He's the only one who really talked about it from the perspective of a thorn. David had a thorn. David talked about pain in his bones. He talked about constant persecution. That's a thorn. It's something that is given to you to keep you low, to keep you in perspective so that you don't become what you used to be back when you were left to your own devices. It's not a bad thing, but it's not comfortable. God speaks to us through that, through the afflictions that he gives us. It's well substantiated in Job 33 and throughout the Bible. As I used to sit there in the mornings at 430, listening to God having him build me, responding to what he was doing in me, he began to heal me. And I tell you all the time that he's going to heal you as an individual. He's going to minister to you as an individual. He's going to build you as an individual. Then he's going to move you to walk in the authority you've been given, the trust that he has given you, whether that's as an employer, maybe even an employee. You have been given a trust to do a certain job as a parent. And then when you have fulfilled, when you have proven worthy of the trust that God has already given you, then you can be given a trust in his house. So God would minister to me and he would teach me who I needed to be and he would cause me to examine myself. I teach you how to do that work in Heart Known Series. And he would talk with me about things that he was upset about, such as the churches. I didn't know anything at that time about the prostitutes that bore out of the Harlot Catholic Church and the Reformation. I didn't know anything about that. But he would talk with me about the churches. He would talk with me about science. And he would talk with me about the education system. And what he would say to me is that they attempt to usurp and covet my glory 
and my sovereignty over my own creations. Years later, he taught me that those churches are the prostitutes that bore out of the harlot Catholic Church, Babylon the Great, in Revelation 17, 5. As he had me writing a soul aligned, he spoke with me about science that he established in his covenant in Exodus 15, 26, that he is the Lord, our healer. That if we obey him and everything that he established, that he would not put on us any of the diseases that he put on the Egyptians. He is the Lord, our healer. That was his covenant. He showed me in his word how he taught his people about defiling skin disease and how you go to the priest and you show the priest, here's what's going on with my skin. And the priest didn't give you a diagnosis. He just took note of what it looked like. To, so that he could have a basis for comparison when you came back out of isolation after seven days. And if you came back out of isolation and you were getting better, you went back into isolation for, ten, for seven more days. And if you came back out and you weren't getting better, you were cast out of the camp. Because the implication is you haven't returned to God and that you have a role in healing and now we have this system where we abdicate all of our power and all of our responsibility, all of our control over to a system of doctors, of idols, who have coveted the role of God in our covenant, who say, we will heal you. And if you don't do what we say, we're going to humiliate you and say you're going against medical advice. And if you don't do what we say with your children, we will call CPS and we will take them away. And we will fear monger you, fear mongering Mothers, when they're delivering their babies, telling them, oh, there's something wrong. We got to rush you in and cut you open. Claiming to be God and telling you whether you will live or die. Do you remember that when Ahaziah fell through the lattice in the roof, that he sent his men to go consult of Baals above as to whether they would live or die, he would live or die? And Elijah said, you go tell Ahaziah that, be, that is there no God in Ekron that you have sent your men to go and consult a Beelzebub as, as to whether you will live or die. Because you have done this, you will surely die. And we wonder why situations are getting worse, not better. Why one thing is fixed and the next thing pops up. Or why there's so much exposure of medical malpractice, pharmaceutical greed and exploitation, insurance greed and exploitation. Lies, constant lies that are being told to us as these major companies within this field of science are funding research to produce results for their agenda. We exalt this field of medicine, of science, whose fundamental premise is that there is no God, that we evolved. There is no God to heal us. There is no covenant anymore. There's science. That's our God. And that science is going to tell us what we're going to do with the world. When climate change comes, they'll save us. They'll tell us what to do. Again, more exploitation. Let's turn everything to solar and power, all dictated by greed. Never mind the covenant that God made in Second Chronicles chapter 7. When I send these things, when I send these things, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, repent and turn from their wicked ways, then I will return to them and heal them and heal their land. That was understood by biblical people. They would pray. Remember Nehemiah, Daniel. They would pray and they would acknowledge their sin. And the reason why God had put them into captivity or sent a plague to destroy their crops, we don't understand it anymore, nor do we believe it. We don't even know that, that, is our, that that's part of our covenant, let alone that we have a covenant. It wasn't until years later, as God was teaching me, the book of Revelation and the times that we're living in and raising me for what he was going to have me do, that I began to understand his grievance with these churches. There's only one church, guys. There's only one church, and that is God's church. That's Zion. There's only one gospel. How could there be division in God's church? No, God tells us what is divided. That's Satan's kingdom. And he says a divided kingdom will not stand. And he demonstrates for us in his word that that fifth kingdom, Babylon fell to Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia fell to Greece, Greece fell to pagan Rome, pagan Rome fell to papal Rome. That fifth kingdom is the Antichrist. Papal Rome started counterfeit Christianity. They love to say that they're the OG, they're the original. Started counterfeit Christianity. In Daniel 2, it says she's got 10 toes. In Revelation 17, 5, it says Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes. What's a prostitute? 
In scripture, a woman is a church. So if you have prostitute women, you have bad churches. There's only one woman, Zion, who is a good woman, and that's his church. And the rest are bad women. What does it mean that they're prostitutes? Because Babylon the Great is described as the great harlot. But then it's also explained that she has prostitute daughters. Those prostitute daughters continue in the prostitutions of their harlot mother, who prostitutes herself to the world. Christmas, Easter, the image of the cross, images of, of pictures of Jesus, statues of Jesus, nativities of Jesus. Sunday Sabbath, Saturday Sabbath, God's Sabbaths are counted down from the moon. They're numbered. They're never named. Christian nationalism, Christian Zionism. These are prostitutions to the world. The Gregorian calendar, God has his own calendar. It's based on the moon. The Gregorian calendar, identifying ourselves based on the doctrines of man. I am a Luther. I am a Calvinist. I am a Wesleyan. I follow Knox. You remember that Paul addressed this in the Bible, that people had been saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas. And Paul said, you don't say that we weren't cru crucified for you. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, only God has been making it grow. You don't say these things. So why did the reformists have it, have it in their heart to go and chase after and identify themselves with the doctrines of man? Because they are the prostitutes that bore out of her and their fruit is the same. And you should be able to see that these things are being exposed right now. The money laundering, the mega churches, the mega millions that they're making, making God a marketplace. The sexual abuse, the distortion of God's word, the leading you back to church and state, campaigning for the Antichrist, preaching Christian nationalism and politics at the pulpit. What is that? And then telling you to pay tithing, guys. Tithing was fulfilled through sacrifice. It was always part of sacrifice. Daniel 11 talks about that tithing, that counterfeit tithing, the tax that is sent out to maintain the royal splendor of the Antichrist harlot and education. What did God establish? You know, in scripture, we see a precedent that children were raised up in the word. They were raised up in the word of God within a home. When did we decide that it was okay to send our children out, outsource our responsibility with our children so that they would learn a bunch of useless information and nothing about what matters to God? Is God not exposing it? Because when he called me in 2019, none of these things were being exposed yet, but they have blown up in the last few years. The lunacy, the bullying, the exploitation of these crazy pagan teachers that we've been sending our kids to while we go do what? have careers? I think back to this, having given up the most important role of my life to raise my little girl to Christ, to be with her and to be the mother that I see her being with her son, that she would come home after having been at work at, at school all day being taught by these jerks. Most of them are jerks. They bully these poor kids and have more homework. So here I am come, coming home pick her up from school to do more work at home, spend less time with her, have somebody else monopolize the relationship that I should be having with my child, and then have them tell me about my child in a parent-teacher conference, and then go punish her for not doing it well enough, for not performing well enough in her carnality because she didn't get a grade that some complete stranger is judging her by. That is absurd that we have this system. It is absurd that we buy into that system. And yes, I was a single mom, but there were things I could have done. With the knowledge I have now, there are things that I could have done and that I would have done. Getting together with other parents and trading off. At least I would know those people. At least there would be some accountability. And perhaps God would have, would have given me another way because if he commands us to obey something, he will make a way. But this education system attempts to covet and usurp the role that God is supposed to be playing in our lives, redefining the way that we should think, the way that we should interact with, with information, the way that we should collect information, defining our values, indoctrinating us. This is horrifying. As a parent, it is horrifying. And my daughter obviously is an adult. She has a, babe, a, a child and is married. 
But this is horrifying for me to think that I raised my daughter to go to university. I raised my daughter to go to graduate school. She got a doctorate. And by the time she got her doctorate, I had abandoned mine. And thank God she was brought to Christ and abandoned hers. But that's a lot of investment in the world to make, all to say, no thanks. I'm, I've found Christ and I'm following him. I taught my daughter how to be a soldier for the world. And I thought that was good. So these are some of the things that God spoke with me about early on. And then there was a time where he was sharing with me that he was about to move the earth. And I hired someone to earthquake proof my house because I thought he was telling me that there was, he was going to send an earthquake. And months later, the COVID shutdowns happened. And I knew that that's what he had been talking about. So there was a period of time that God really had to clean me up and he had to teach me how to listen to him, how to not run off on my own and think that I knew his ways. Because just because God tells you something, he's got to teach you what his ways are. We have to stay in step with him. And so that's one of the things that he had to teach me. And I remember that one day I was taking a shower and he was talking with me and telling me that I was going to write a book. I'd had it in my heart for a long time that I wanted to write a book because I was a trained psychologist and I wanted to write a book on spiritual healing, but there is no spiritual healing in psychology. This was something that I really, really had it in my heart that I wanted to do for many, many years, even before I applied to graduate school. I wanted to be able to help people to, be, to have that spiritual healing and indeed because I lacked it. Well, as he was taking me through this healing process, he told me I was going to write a book and he began to move me as he was healing me each day and, and convicting me and speaking certain things with me. He would build in me and then he would have me go and write it down. But as I was writing, I would think, well, I'm a trained researcher in this field of science. I have to substantiate the things that I say. Now I understand the ridiculousness of that because God does not use the wise things of the world. He uses, uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So I would write down what he had done with me and then I would go searching for something in the field of psychology in order to substantiate it. And I did that for about a year and a half. And though there were good nuggets of what God had been doing in me, I completely defiled that entire book. I sent it off to the editor, and by the time I got it back, God had let me know that I'd be throwing it away. A year and a half, every single day of my life, throwing it away. And I was really upset about it, but I understood the value because he's told me, he helped me to understand that everything has to stand on his truth and that I was going to be writing a very different kind of book and that that book was going to stand on his word and on the testimony he was building in me. And that I didn't any longer need any of that baloney from the world. That he had already proven to me that it was false. And that he needed to work that out of me. He needed to demonstrate to me a year and a half investment. That, ev that if I go to the world, that the entire book would be garbage. And he made it clear. And I started writing a new book and it was based on scripture. And it was based on what God was building in me. What he was doing on a daily basis every day for another year and a half. I think it was a year and a half. So he used that first book to really clean me up, to take me out of Babylon and to take Babylon out of me. Not that he's done with that work because he continues it, but he used that to build me. And I want you to know there's so much building that God has to do in us. We don't even know what it is. I mean, when God called me to himself, he told me things like, you're about to unlearn everything you think you know. I still thought that Oh, this is the reason why, you know, with all the adversity that I faced in my life, that I was able to get a doctorate. This is why he's going to use my credentials. Oh, he uses my credentials, all right. He uses my credentials as the basis to debunk my worldly credentials so that I, my testimony to you is that what I learned in the world was a lie. I have the authority to tell you that, that what I learned in the world was an absolute lie, that those credentials are not worth anything. As far as truth goes, they do not heal. He told me things like, you've seen what you can do. Now you'll see what I will do. I had accomplished a lot, particularly coming from where I came from. Two uneducated parents, one an immigrant from Argentina who used to ride my bike, not even her bike, to work to go cook fries in a kitchen. 
incredible abuse, abuse that I, I don't even delve into unless it's important to the message that God has me speaking. Incredible abuse. And I do have a basis for comparison because I've worked many different settings, including county hospital, where there are very, there's very severe spiritual issues. And I did not come upon stories like mine. I lived in a tent as an adolescent, a tent on the street. I had a child at 17 years old and I got a doctorate and I raised that child to the best of my ability and I built three businesses and I had acquired great wealth. I never thought I'd be worried about money ever, ever again or concerned about money ever, ever again. But when God called me to himself, he began to show me that what I was teaching and what I was doing and that the expertise that brought me status and wealth in the world were not of him. And by that time, he had proven himself to me. And he asked me, what's it going to be? I had contracts with facilities that took me years to get those contracts, years to build that career. I had two mortgages, one at my house and one at a building that I had purchased. And now he was calling me out of it with nothing, with nothing. I asked him, should I get another job? Should I do this? Should I do that? In the beginning, I thought, okay, these books, this is going to be my livelihood. Everyone's going to want to know truth. My goodness, no one cares about truth, guys. But after publishing those books, shortly after publishing those books, I realized it's wrong to charge people. (laughs) How could I prevent someone from hearing the truth? How could I prevent them from hearing my testimony? How could I prevent them from having access to the healing that was so freely given to me by God? And I knew that I had to provide those books for free. And so I've been doing that ever since. Obviously, if someone wants a hard copy, they got to pay for that because I I can't afford the printing costs. But the PDFs are provided free of charge on the homepage of this channel. The Bible studies, the workshops, I don't charge for anything because Jesus said not to make a marketplace of his father's house. And if I'm going to be serving in his house, I'm going to need to trust him to provide for me. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And I lived on that retirement that I had been saving that whole time. No husband, single mom, saved a retirement. I cashed that out. I lived on my savings. And now I have nothing. But I trust that the Lord is going to provide for me. And I want you to know something about that. You cannot have that kind of faith if you don't know what you're doing with God. If you are not certain of what your role is with God, you cannot do that. There is no way that anyone would make that decision if they weren't certain of what God has raised them to do. I have given everything to become the scum of the earth, to go from a luxurious life of wealth and beautiful clothing and shoes and handbags, jewelry, my hair always dyed, my hair always done, my nails always done, a very wealthy, worldly woman to become nothing, no backup plan, no savings account, nothing. I know what I'm doing. God built me very early on as I was proving myself by doing this work, by responding to his convictions, by getting rid of those shoes and those clothes, he began to teach me that I was going to die for what I was doing. And not only was he talking to me about that, but he was testing me. And so he would cause me to imagine that certain things might happen, that I might lose this or that, that I might be hurt in this way or that, that my family would be hurt in this way or that. And there were things that he showed me that I would think, no, no, not that. I'm not talking about things. Because when he showed me I might lose my license, I thought, okay, it's a thing, but I trust you. I'm talking about the precious things in my life, the relationships, the people. I hardly even want to say it or acknowledge it out loud. But I know in my heart that God's in control of everything. And I would call people that I knew who were theologians, they were trained in seminary, supposed to understand the word, supposed to understand what's going to happen. And I would tell him, this is what God's telling me. I'm going to die for what he has me doing, for what he has me saying. And they would say, no, no, that's not who God is. No, but I knew what God was telling me. I knew that what I was hearing was true. And I think probably a year later after he had brought me to the book of Revelation and shown me what I was going to be doing and telling me things like you're in a capa- you are in a John the Baptist like capacity. And sometimes I tell you the story about 
you know, how I was sitting at that back table and I have this lemon tree that has kind of this unique feature in the trunk where the, um, you know, there's a trunk and then there's branches that come off of it and they kind of weave together and that, you know, he, he will speak to you in whatever, especially when you don't have a repertoire for the Bible yet. He would speak to me about certain things and then he'd show me where they were in the Bible because I didn't have the language or understanding for a body of Christ. I wouldn't have known what that was. But he spoke to me through that lemon tree and through those branches and he, and he said, you're only one part of this. So that as he was telling me, you're in this John the Baptist-like capacity, I didn't hear that and think, oh, I'm so wonderful. I'm so you know, special. That isn't, that isn't how he communicated it. And that isn't at all how I received it or interpreted it. But he would just teach me these things one by one, adding the layers and putting together a picture. You're only one part of this. And he began to teach me Revelation. That was the first book he started with. And it's such an important book. And I'll tell you why, because it's everything that the prophets have, have talked about, have pointed forward to including Jesus. It brings that whole picture together. And so it's no wonder why there have been so many missing, you know, false interpretations or uh, negating, uh, you know, even recently someone coming on the channel and telling me that the book of Revelation is not true, that it was somehow added by the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> no, the book of Revelation is true. And I know that for, I know that uh, I, there is not a doubt in my heart that the book of Revelation is true because that's the first book God taught me. And because when you read Revelation, you have an understanding of it. And then you go and read the prophets. You're like, my goodness, it's right here. It's right here. They talked about it. No one can do that. The book of Revelation has so much symbolism. You cannot read it by your carnality. No one is that intelligent or sly or whatever that they can take pieces of the Bible and put together this fake book the book of Revelation, and then have God testify to it. I mean, I'm sorry for them that they don't understand that, but that's ridiculous. As he began to teach me the book of Revelation, he also began to teach me my role as a witness, as one of the 144,000. Now, I'm not talking in terms of Jehovah's Witness who think that there's only 144,000 who are going to be saved. I'm talking about the book of Revelation and what the Bible actually says. There is a multitude in white robes that are going to be saved that no one could count. There is 144,000, a literal number, who are the two witnesses. They are the two lampstands and the two olive trees in the entire world. They're wearing sackcloth and ashes. They're not wearing the clothes I used to wear, okay? So these aren't, phys these aren't literal clothes. But what I'm saying is they are dressed in grief and mourning. These are the clothes that people would wear them when they were grieving, when they were mourning, when they were fasting, when they were returning to God, when they were lowly, bringing themselves low. So do you think that God needed, needed to take me there? And, you know, I see the value. I see the value in the fact that he didn't call me when I was living in that tent. He called me when I had wealth that I didn't even know what to do with. He called me when I had arrived at the place that I wanted to arrive. I was semi-retired at 40 years old. That's when he called me. So that when you give something up like that, it means something. It wasn't like I was handing over a lowly situation for another lowly situation. I was letting go of everything that I had built, all of the security that I had worked so hard for that, by the way, never, never made me feel secure. As time went on and God was building me and had me publish those books, he told me in 2022 that he was going to anoint his witnesses on Pentecost 2022. And at that time, I still thought that Reformed Judaism had God's calendar because that's what they say, right? That they've been keeping God's calendar all these years. Absolute lie. I had no idea that they had prostituted themselves to the Harlot Catholic Church and their Gregorian calendar, adding a leap year, adding a second calendar, claiming that they have a new year, Rosh Hashanah, that's actually God's feast of trumpets. I had no idea. I had no idea that the Bible tells us that God is going to remove that calendar and remove those holy days and Sabbaths and new moons. And that the Bible also implies that he's going to reinstitute it later on in the third temple. By the way, we're the third temple. Living stones being fitted together to rise and become a holy temple in the Lord. That year, 2022, I was already, I had already started the channel. And on May 22nd, I was doing a video and I said, God's doing something different with me today. He's telling me to open my mouth. All this time, 
I've been doing these workshops and I've been doing, you know, these uh, videos and I've been planning and I've been, you know, creating a lesson. But today he's telling me, open your mouth and speak. And I've been doing that ever since May 22nd, 2022. Well, June 4th that year, I was observing counterfeit Pentecost, unfortunately. And I was so disappointed that nothing happened. I was waiting for this tongues of fire experience, but I was still doing videos and I was not preparing. I was opening my mouth and speaking. And I remember calling, calling a friend and telling him, I just don't understand. He told me that he was going to do this on Pentecost. And he said to me, I think he's already done it. Something has changed. A year later, the body and I were celebrating what we thought was Passover. We were getting ready to meet on the last day of Passover, May 7th, 2023. And God was talking to me and he kept pressing on me and telling me this is Pentecost. And I was thinking, what? how could it be? How could it be? And we came together and I said, God's telling me this is Pentecost. And that began a process of starting to discern God's calendar. And as we counted back, according to God's new moon, which is actually the crescent moon, May 22nd, 2022 was Pentecost. Based on God's moon, there is no way that I could have made that up. It is absolutely impossible for me to have made that up. Not only that, that video is on the channel as proof of what he was doing with me on that day. At that time, a lot of the members of the, uh, of the body, in fact, I think all of them were, or, or most of them were willing to just sort of accept what it was that I was telling them. And that did not please me. I was actually very upset about it. I was very grieved. And I kind of rebuked them and let them know, you can't just take what I'm saying to you and not go and discern it. You have to discern this. And some people left because they did not, they didn't like that I rebuked them. But of those who stayed, of those who had the heart to understand their responsibility in the covenant, they discerned. And God gave confirmation to each and every person in their own personal way that that was indeed Pentecost. Now, when he first called me to himself, I believed in something called the pre-tribulation rapture. All it takes is a little bit of false doctrine to just mess everything up, to make everything orient to that falsehood. And God had to teach me this. He had to teach me that I had to stay with his spirit alone, that I could not go to commentaries. I could not go to Google. I could not go to people's sermons to try to understand what's written in his word, that that was an oxymoron to go to the world to tell me what truth is, but that I had to go to the spirit of truth and then I would understand. And he said that I needed to stay with him. And every time, because I didn't listen, I didn't listen purely, I would get frustrated because I would think, I need to know this right now. I need to know it right now. And he would test me. I would be reading, 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 studying, taking my notes, writing things down, trying to understand what, what are these end times? What is this book of Revelation? Then I get stuck on one spot that I, could, I just could not discern it. And God would not give me the answer. And I would get so frustrated, I would go to a sermon or I would go to a commentary. And what he would do is he would set me back several days on my discernment because he would hand me over to deception. And then he would point out that I had been deceived and that there was no way to rec reconcile that doctrine that I had ingested with what's written in the actual word. And then it would take me several more days to discern and get out of that falsehood. And he did it over and over and over until he broke me and I no longer did that. I finally got the message, okay, you win. I am not gonna win here fighting against you. And from that point on, I've not been deceived about the word. That is my testimony. I want you to know that that, that is a really important part of testimony that God has the ability to give you understanding and he will not deceive you. He will deceive you if you go to man. If you go to man or you go to the world or you go to someone who you have not discerned whether they are from him and you go and seek your answers from that idol, setting them up as an idol, he will hand you over to the deception you've chose, chosen. But if you go to him and you discern his shepherds and you make sure that the people you are listening to are actually from him and are actually speaking truth, then he will keep you in truth. And this is how God taught me his word. This is how he taught me about the first resurrection. And if there's a first, there's a second. This is how he also taught me about the second this is how he taught me about end times. And then he started showing me how it was being fulfilled in the actual world. This is how he taught me what my role is. There is no way that I could have lined up him calling me, him anointing me, him telling me what I'm doing as a witness and then fulfilling things within the timeline that he has laid out in his word. There is no way. 
There are only 1,260 days that the witnesses are testifying. And truly, even less than that, because these are God days. These are days that, you know, for example, you have a, you have a 29.5, 24-hour day that is the moon cycle. And so, actually, the last day of the month could be split with the first day of the month. Because there's not a full 12-hour period there to make 24-hour days. So you have 354 24-hour days on a lunar calendar. But God identifies that lunar calendar as being 360 days. So the last day of the month can be kicked out when the first day of the month starts. And the first day of the month is defined by that crescent moon appearing. So you could actually have the last day of the month and the first day of the month being less than 24-hour days. That's a little too complicated to get into in this video, but hopefully that's enough to kind of explain that this isn't the longest period for, for me to be testifying. And there are so many things that he has fulfilled within this time period subsequent to telling me these are the things that are going to happen within this period. Let me give you an example. From May 22nd, 2022, those 1260 God days are going to be completed October 7th, 2025. That is when the Antichrist will rise. Somewhere in those days, the Antichrist will rise. And the Antichrist will overpower and kill the witnesses first and then go, then go off to pursue the rest of God's people. Now, Revelation 12 tells us exactly why that Antichrist kills the witnesses. It has not been able to touch the witnesses the entire time they've been prophesying. They have been protected by God. And there are two requirements in order for Satan to be thrown out of the heavenly realms. The first is the blood of the lamb. And the second is the testimony of two witnesses, two or more witnesses in God's law. That's why even though, they're call, even though they are actually 144,000 in the whole world, they are called the two witnesses because what God is showing you is why it is that they need to testify. That's what he's revealing to you. They need to testify because in his law, he has stated that in order to convict, acquit, prove a matter, establish a matter, there must be two or more testimonies of witnesses. This is the second criteria that is required in order for Satan to be thrown out of the heavenly realms. And Revelation 12 says they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So they know that they are going to die. It's not like they bear their testimony for 1260 days and then God's like, okay, now you're going to die. No. What God did with me in teaching me that I was going to die, even though those theologians that I was calling and telling, God is telling me I'm going to die for what I'm doing, did not seem to know what in the world I was talking about. Why? It's not just the witnesses who are going to die. The entire multitude in white robes are going to die. Why didn't they know that? They were theologically trained. I'm going to tell you why. Because those universities that make a marketplace of God that are getting paid cause you to read and ingest false doctrines in commentaries and books. They don't have you reading the word of God by his spirit. They don't have God as the judge or the teacher. They have a professor who now grades you on your own carnality. That's why. So now your focus is on pleasing the teacher and not pleasing God. Now let me ask you something. Next year, I'm telling you that I'm going to die in a little bit more than a year. Revelation 2 says that the witnesses are going to, some of them are going to be uh, imprisoned so that the devil is going to test them for 10 days and then they're going to die. Revelation 13, as God has revealed in the last several months, is talks about the image of the Antichrist, the image of the beast, and says that the false prophet of the United States, by the way, the seventh kingdom, has created this image of the beast that all of the Antichrist worships and receives its mark in their heart. So it has imprinted their ideology into their hearts so that this is what they believe. This is what comes out of their deeds, their speech, their beliefs, their thoughts. What is counterfeit Christianity worshiping right now? Counterfeit Israel? Christian Zionists campaigning for the Antichrist in Christian nationalism. God has taught me and I have therefore taught you. The key players of this end times. The Antichrist, the false prophet, the image of the beast. Western Europe, that is the ten horns that the Antichrist is wearing. Babylon the Great, the Harlot Catholic Church, and the prostitutes that bore out of her. All of these things he's taught me, and I've taught them to you. I've taught you about the mark of the beast coming from your heart, that this is not a chip or a tattoo or something that's going to defile you externally. I've taught you about the abomination of desolation, in which we see in Ezekiel that that is the cross 
to Tammuz that Constantine the fake set up in the Harlot Catholic Church within counterfeit Christianity. That cross that everyone thinks, that's the symbol. The symbol? The image, you mean? Of counterfeit Christianity. The world, if you were to look this up, the world would tell you, Google would tell you, that this is the symbol of Christianity. But we don't have a symbol because God told us not to set up images. That is the abomination of desolation. That is what will be set up in the hearts of people who have not loved truth. It will be counterfeit Christianity, the image of counterfeit Christianity. I've told you what the Antichrist is. I've told you that it is a kingdom and that it is, a, it, it is the kingdom that started counterfeit Christianity and continues in the prostitutes that bore out of her. I've proven to you that the false prophet is the United States because there are eight kingdoms and the eighth is one of the seven and is actually the fifth kingdom. And in Daniel 2, we're told exactly where those kingdoms start. That head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, this is you. This represents you, your kingdom, Babylon. Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia fell to Greece. Greece fell to pagan Rome. Pagan Rome fell to papal Rome. There's your antichrist. Papal Rome fell to atheistic communism, Napoleon. And communism fell to the United States. There's your seventh kingdom. The eighth is one of the seven and is the antichrist. Number five, pagan Rome, papal Rome, excuse me. So if from the fifth kingdom, you only have two more, other, two other kingdoms that could be testifying to it, it's not going to be Napoleon because he's the one who brought you down. It's the United States that has been working to bring this Antichrist back. Revelation 13 tells us that that, anti, that that false prophet of the United States, that second beast, as is referred to in Revelation 13, but it's actually the seventh of all of those kingdoms, that false prophet has two purposes. One is to testify to the Antichrist. The other is to set up the image that counterfeit Christianity is worshiping. It is a fake Messiah, a false God of counterfeit Israel. And what is counterfeit Israel doing right now? They have immense power through APAC to be able to influence our presidential candidates, our congressional candidates, lobbying for or against with millions and millions of dollars, by the way. Everyone has been bought by them. I don't see a single political candidate who is saying what Israel is actually doing. Those mainstream political candidates are saying Israel has a right to defend itself. Not Palestine has a right to defend itself. Israel has a right to defend itself. You can see in the United States and in Europe, Western Europe, the 10 horns that are being worn by that Antichrist, that people are being arrested as terrorists for basic free speech. People are being tortured. They're being fired from their jobs for basic free speech. This is something that has always been a security in the United States. Like you say the Constitution and everybody shuts up. So what's happening at this point in history, guys? Because I hear, press, I, I hear pagans saying, this is unprecedented, completely befuddled by what's happening right now. But I don't hear God's people saying, well, this is what's happening. And here's where it's written in God's word. I do, and no one listens to me. Pagans are befuddled by it, but I don't see why God's people aren't looking at this and saying, my gosh, what is God doing? I don't even think it's in their heart to ask that question as if they actually believe that there is a God doing anything. And yet for the last almost three years that I've been on this channel, I've been telling you what it is that I'm doing. I've been educating you on the word and I've been showing you as God shows me what's going on in the world right now. Right now, at this point in history, this image of the beast is persecuting and killing people, is requiring people to worship it or be killed. Counterfeit Christianity, the Antichrist, is bowing down and worshiping this abomination. So it should not confuse you. You shouldn't think, oh, Carrie, this is just, you know, a little too much. You should be able to see that if it weren't for God holding this back right now, the witnesses would be killed right now. If it weren't for God's promise that for 1260 days, that the witnesses cannot be touched, that no one is going to harm them. If it weren't for that, I'd be gone already, you guys. And then Antichrist would be going after you. All of this complicity and this silence is going to come on your heads. You need to open your mouth and be a witness. You need to return to God and ask him, how does he want to use you? Because this is the image. It is that image in Revelation 13 that requires everyone to worship it and receive its mark.
or be killed. Now, there's something that God did, and I can't make this up. I mean, you know, these things are documented. A lot of the things that I'm saying to you, many of them are outright documented. I couldn't have made them up, just like that video, May, May 22nd. When I wrote A Soul Aligned, I talked about a movement called Wissenschaft des Judentums. And I really took this up with God because it was a little scary for me to write about that. This is a movement that happened in Germany just before World War II, where Jews had decided to reform God's word. I don't know why in the world you would ever think that you needed to reform God's word. But the, this statement, this title of this movement Wissenschaft des Judentums is the science of Judaism. What did I say were the three things that God t- spoke with me about early on? The science of Judaism. Science was one of those things. Science, the churches, and the education system. Jews did not want to be part of, did not want to be separated from the world. They wanted to be taken seriously. So they reformed God's word in a movement called, called the science of Judaism, Wissenschaft des Judentums. They set up the first synagogues and universities to spread this disease of reform Judaism that has now become Zionism or been joined with Zionism. These were Ashkenazi Jews from Germany. Well, I read to you Deuteronomy 28. I mentioned to you Leviticus 26, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, Exodus 15, 26, in which God says, if you obey him and what he has established, he will not put on you any of the diseases that he put on the Egyptians He is the Lord, your healer. You don't need to go to these idols. You don't need to defer to that false God to heal you or the work of your hands. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, he tells you all the things he's going to do to you if you disobey him. And he talks about terrible, terrible things, things that happened in the Holocaust. And he says, he is the one who is going to cause those things to happen to you. If you don't believe it, read it. Second Chronicles chapter 7, he talks about, when I start sending these things on the earth, if my people who are called by my name will return to me, I will return to them. If they return to me and seek my face and repent and turn from their wicked ways, I will return to them and I will heal them and I will restore their land. But if they go off to serve other gods, I will make them an object of scorn, a byword, an object of ridicule among the nations, so that when people walk by, they will say, why has the Lord done this to his people, to his temple. And they will respond because they have forsaken the Lord. Is he just threatening empty words? And so I demonstrate for you in part because I'm trying to get the attention of those calling themselves Christian to let them know you're not observing his holy days. What makes you think that this pagan holiday of Christmas or Easter please the Lord? What makes you think that your prostitutions to the world please him and your separation from what he has established in Judaism and the fulfillment of Judaism, which which is Christianity, because it wasn't Christians who were promised a Christ. It was Jews in Judaism who were promised a Christ. So the fulfillment of when you get that Christ becomes Christianity. Christians already have the Christ. How are you going to separate yourself and say, no, those are... The holy days are for Jews. Us Christians get the holidays. They need to sit with God and do things the way he established. But we indulge our flesh. What kind of wickedness is that? Thanks be to God we don't have to observe his Sabbaths anymore. What kind of wickedness is this? And so if this is what he did when they reformed his word before, what do you think he's going to do now that... Counterfeit Christianity has reformed his word. He taught me his word. He taught me end times, and he started showing me how it was being fulfilled. I've spoken to you about it as it's been happening, as he's been speaking to me. I don't hold anything back from you guys. I'm not afraid to speak the message that he tells me to speak. I'm not afraid to be a watchman. I'm not afraid to rebuke. It doesn't feel good. There are times when I really am reluctant about it, but I'm not afraid because the worst thing that's going to happen to me is going to happen to me. And it's going to happen next year. And it can't come soon enough, quite frankly. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm not living some high life. My life is low and it's very uncomfortable. And no one wants to hear the things that I say. Now, let me ask you something. How is it possible that he had me writing about that about the very Jews who are doing counterfeit Jews, right? In Revelation 3, 
9 and 2 9, he talks about these people who call themselves Jews, though they are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And he says, I'm going to make them fall down and, and acknowledge that I have loved you. Why does he say that? Because that very group of people are written about in Revelation 13, in which he's talking about the image of the beast that's claiming to be chosen and is persecuting actually the people of God. And these are those people who he had me talking about. These people who are perpetually claiming to be victims. I don't know how that is because all throughout the Bible, when, when people of the Bible found themselves in captivity, found themselves in a bad situation, they returned to God and they said, our ancestors sinned, we sinned. These are the things that we understand. We acknowledge our sins. We recommit ourselves to you. We are returning to you. We are repenting. We're affixing our seals to the promises that we're making to you. That's what they did. But this group of people... They're perpetual victims and everyone gets to pay the price for it. And in fact, everyone gets to worship them. I'm sorry, how does that work? Because God is even, either sovereign or he's not. And so if he says, these are the things that I'm going to send you, then when those things start happening, then you turn to God and you say, okay, show me what I've done. Clean me up. Here are the things that I understand that I've done. Show me who else I've been. That's what people of God do. That's not what these people are doing. And I'm not talking about an ethnic group. I'm talking about people with a particular ideology because I hear many Orthodox Jews talking about the watered down secularism that is reformed Judaism that came out of this movement of Wissenschaft des Judentums. So I'm not talking about an ethnicity. I'm not even talking about religious people because these are not religious people. They are secular people. This is an ideology. It is a satanic ideology and you should be able to see the fruit. But when he had me writing about that, and, you know, you can look at the published date of the books and understand that he was talking to me about this long before all of this was being laid bare. That's my witness that this was published long ago. And when he was talking with me about it and telling me that I needed to put that in the book, I, I was turning up to him and like, okay, I'm going to do whatever you say, but I'm going to be accused of some things here. And this is going to cause me to be harmed. And that's become all the more clear in the last 11 months. That has become very clear. I will be killed for what I'm saying. There is no free speech anymore, guys. And all these things have to happen. You know, there wasn't free speech when Peter was talking about these things and he was being told by the Sanhedrin, stop speaking in this, in this man's name. There wasn't free speech then. Satan was trying to squelch what they were saying. But what was Peter's response? And I, I give you the same response. Peter's response was, are we supposed to listen to man or to God? That's my same response. I'm not afraid of anything because everything that happens to me is in his hands. What was Jesus' response when Pilate said, don't you realize I have the authority to decide whether you're going to live or die? You only have that authority because God gave it to you. I'm not afraid. I know my God. I know what he has me doing. I know what he's taught me. I know what he testifies to. I know the witnesses that I'm telling you, that video, that chapter in the book. These things are my witness. I can't fabricate that. Nor could I make these things line up so that next year, the very things that are happening right now are going to happen next year. Three years ago, you couldn't even fathom what's going on right now with this group of people. And yet God required me to speak it, didn't he? So don't believe me. Believe on the deeds themselves. That's what Jesus said. Don't believe me. Believe on the deeds themselves. Am I speaking the truth or not? But let me tell you about what it's like to be a witness. No one listens because they don't listen to him. And we were told that in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 3 and, and Ezekiel 33. Hatred, slander, lowliness, nothing. And nothing that they would be attracted to or desire any of God's servants. I think the loneliest part is that no one listens to you, but you have to keep validating and going to God and waiting for that confirmation that what you're saying and know to be true is true. Because when people are not listening or when people are speaking against you, it's a little crazy making. One of the other lo loneliest parts of this is that your own family does not believe. The people closest to you, the people you love the most, you cannot make them see. One of the most grievous parts and shocking parts, I tell you that when God first started speaking truth to me, that I thought, my goodness, I've wanted to know this my, I, I, I didn't even know I'd wanted to know this my whole life. I've wanted truth. I've wanted a place to belong. I've wanted you, Lord. So when he starts speaking truth to you and you've been seeking truth 
and, and, and dying over it your whole life, you think everyone's going to want to know this. They're going to be so happy that they know this. I'm going to be so busy talking to everybody about what the truth is. But let me tell you the reality. Shock, grief over the lack of love for truth. And some listen, but they don't put it into practice. And also how easy they can turn their backs when it's too hard. All the blah, blah, blah that comes out of their mouth about, oh God, I love, just love him, love him, love him, love, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then you tell them something like, hey, you're still not taking off God's Sabbaths. What's going on there? Do you believe that God will provide a way for you to obey what he commands? Do you realize that the word says that this is going to be a sign between you and him on your right hand and your forehead? We've gotten messages, not even a, not a phone call, not an explanation, not showing up and having some courage to actually speak these things in person, but a text message. I know these things, I know this is a test, but I'm going to separate from the body. <laughs> what? I know this is a test. I know that God is testing me, but I'm going to separate from the body. Okay, that easy. That easy to give up your salvation. Because the word says that those who have been enlightened, it is impossible for those who have been enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift to fall and then be brought back into repentance because to do so would be to crucify the son all over again. How does a person give up their salvation that quickly? Particularly when they've been part of a body where they've seen miracles happen, where they have seen God's truth being revealed. It, it blows me away. Like there, there has to be an emoji for how blown up my brain is by that. I don't think the current one covers it. I mean, that really just blows me away. But it's wickedness. That's evil. That is a person who does not love truth. I think the hardest part of doing this is to know the truth with all my heart, but to not be able to make anyone see. And to plead with the people I love and to plead with God. Please make them see. You're the only one. You're the only one who can make them see. You're the only one who can do this. Please make them see. Please don't let them be lost. Bring them as low as you have to bring them, but don't let them be lost. That's the hardest part about doing this because you know truth and how can you make anyone see it? How can you give them that heart? How can you, I mean, really it is about giving them that heart. It's not about anything behavioral. It's really about like, do you have the heart to genuinely pursue God and return to him and break yourself in front of him or not? It's not a box that can be checked. It's like a genuine rending and breaking yourself down to know him and to discern whether these things are true or not. There was something sort of cathartic about doing this. I just hope that I've done justice to it because I just feel like there's so much that God has done and to try to to try to talk about all of it is just like impossible. But these are major things. These are major things that he has revealed to me that I couldn't make up. I'm grateful that there are some witnesses out there, that there is the, the video, the book. I'm grateful because I couldn't make those things up. And so not only are they witnesses to you, but they're also witnesses to me. And I need those witnesses ever so often. I know that might sound crazy, but like I said, you know, with everyone denying what the truth is, it's very difficult to maintain your own sanity and sense of reality. So I have to go back to God every single day and, and be like, okay, can you just give me something to confirm that I'm doing this? I mean, I'm in a very difficult position of not having anything right now, having, you know, um, less than two months of just my bills. I'm not even talking about mortgage. And please don't, I'm not asking you for anything, but, but I'm, I'm sharing with you where I'm at right now. That's the position I'm in. And I believe with all my heart because, not because God has told me what he's going to do about my pills. You know, it's a very difficult position to be in and for him not to, you know, to have, have told me this is your job. This is what you're doing. And I am the one who will take care of you. It's a very hard thing to go through. And so, as I said at the beginning of the video, in order to be able to do this, in order to be able to stand in this kind of faith, you have to know. You have to know on a daily basis, receive that confirmation from God that you're doing what you think you're doing. And I, and I literally go to him every single day. I need to know every single day. And you know what? It's not a bad thing to do that. It keeps you in step with him. It keeps you from becoming puffed up and arrogant. 
Now, it also has to be balanced with the fact that you have to do the validating for yourself and then understand that he will validate in his own time. You can't replace your own personal accountability work with, you know, some demand on God for him to constantly assure you. But that's a very hard part of this. I hope my testimony has been of value to you. I hope it means something to you. Thank you for listening. Please discern this with God.